that's the finished boat that we use a lot actually me and josephine we've been using it not mm. so much this year actually the weather's been awful this winter but um it's had a lot of use since we built it in about 2017 and it's been used something like once a fortnight since then on average which is is quite good i think um it was built it was josephine wanted us an, another boat because the the boat that we've been sailing for decades is, is one that is a dinghy, a sailing dinghy, but you, you need the car and the trailer to tow it around. And uh, Josephine liked the idea of a little lightweight boat that she could launch on our local beach. Um, we never actually, it's never actually been used that way. Although it's quite a small boat, it's still a bit too, it's just too much for one person to, to, to get it down to the beach. I mean, she doesn't, Josephine doesn't actually drive, which, you know, makes it difficult. Um, and we start, we used to begin with, we thought we'd get a canoe and we didn't really get on with the canoe. We, I think because we're just not very used to paddling a canoe. I mean, uh, nothing wrong with canoeing, but most of the boating we've done, if we haven't been sailing, we've been rowing. So I think rowing comes more easily to us than, than paddling. Um, so I, we're happy with a rowing boat, but a canoe, you could easily use, a canoe would do what everything we've done, or maybe two canoes, one each, would do everything that we do with the rowing boat, in fact. Um, and yeah, we wanted, I mean, it, it needed to be a boat that we could both use, obviously, that was the main requirement, but I thought it'd be nice to be able to use it with just one person rowing as well. In fact, we very rarely nearly always we we, do, we we go out together actually but um it does have the capability to row with one person um and i, I looked at the idea of um the, uh, for, there were some forward facing rowing systems which would be nice and if you were rowing on your own i think that would be very attractive but since most of our rowing was, is with two people in the boat and one person taking a rest and the other person rowing there's actually no there's no need to, to face forwards while we're rowing. It's, it's, it's more sociable and it's more, it's nicer really to have one person rowing facing aft and one person at the back of the boat looking forwards and steering. That, that, that's, so, you know, for, for, for our purposes, forward facing rowing wouldn't be, uh, wouldn't be advan an advantage. Um, and I also looked, I also was interested in um, what the rowing people call a sliding rigger where the Rolex move instead of a, a sliding seat. Um, we, we've never tried that. I didn't, haven't taken it that far. And it slightly compromised the design of the boat to make that possible. Um, I probably wouldn't bother with that. It, there is some advantage apparently, but it's it's a fairly small advantage. So anyway, try and, get, try and move on. I haven't got too many slides this time. Um, as I say, I'll try, and, I'll try and talk about the computer-aided design um, I've, I've been using SolidWorks um, and I don't actually have a lot of experience with other CAD systems other than one or two of the expensive ones like Catier and um, um, what's the other, the Inventor, yeah. Um, I, I don't actually know much about the, the, the low cost or, or free systems and I think that's, a, that's something we ought to um, look at, as, you know, in airs and we could do with a we could do some articles perhaps in Catalyst to tell people, you know, what they can do with free software or, or, or fairly cheap. I mean, a cheap software would be anything under £100, I think would be quite, I mean, it doesn't buy much sheet of, many sheets of plywood, does it? Um, but but SolidWorks is, 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 is not available to everybody, obviously. But the way I do it with SolidWorks, and it, this may be applicable to other systems as well, I'm not sure, is I always start sketching you know, whatever I'm drawing, whether it's a piece of machinery or a boat or anything else, um, I would start with sketches on the computer, not sketches in pencil on paper. And with SolidWorks, you can do these sort of, this isn't actually the rowing boat, it's another thing I was looking at, um, but you can do these sort of sketches um, very quickly. They look messy. Um, you don't worry about it's not like drawing to BS 308, you know, standard. It's you just put the dimensions any way you want and the computer will sort it out eventually. And you sketch, you know, the, a framework if you like. Um, with boats, I've started with an elevation plan, a side view. Um, and then I do a 
probably a view from the top and then maybe a section in the middle, something like that. And I put all those sketches in, in the way I do it, and there's probably other ways to do it. I start by putting all those initial sketches into one file, one computer file. And then when I draw all the other parts of the boat, like say the rudder, the hull, of course, um, all the bits and pieces that make up a boat, um, each, each of those separate components is going to be a computer file. And each of those files, those separate files will reference the initial sketch file. So any changes that you make on this initial sketches get incorporated automatically into, into the drawings you're doing of all the details. I don't know if that makes sense, but it, I mean, if you follow a, a sort of way of working like that, it, it, it makes it vastly easier compared with, it's so much easier once you get used to it than traditional drawing on a drawing board. And there's, there's never any rubbing out really. I mean, you might delete whole files, but you know, you can, you know, I can change. I mean, that that's actually an elevation of a hull. Um, I mean, and don't worry about what it actually is. But I mean, you can change any of the dimensions on that sketch, and it the change will propagate right through the system, and all your other related drawings change with it. So, um, uh, the way of with boats, if you're drawing a boat, I've tended to use um, a loft. What's called a loft function, loft feature, I think it'd be called in SolidWorks, to make the shape of the hull. Um, there are, I mean, I think if you, we, there are other ways of doing it, actually. There's, there's a, fr a free form surface that you could probably do the same thing, but I, I, I've done it with a loft. And what that means is that you draw across, you tr draw cross sections of the boat um, as sketches. I mean, I, I, there's no point going into the details of SolidWorks because you you know you'll probably be using something different, but I think most CAD software will have a loft function in it. So you draw cross sections. Um, the one at the bow, I find, has to be twisted. So it, it's a it's not really a cross section, but it gives you the shape of the bow. And then the software just sweeps through those sections and makes a solid object on the screen. Not a solid object in reality, of course, but it's in the computer. It's a solid object. Um, and then you have the problem that you probably want to know how it's going to float. Well, the software will automatically tell you the weight of everything you draw because you specify materials and so on. So you're going to be, you're going to know the weight to very accurately indeed. Um, and the way I the way I find out how it's going to float is to take that solid uh, solid model you call it that solid block. And just slice it off at the waterline. You guess guess a waterline position to start with, right? Just make a guess of where you think the waterline is going to be. Slice your hull model. Um, use the uh, computer's uh, use the software's um, mass properties function to tell you the volume of that underwater part and that where its center of gravity is, and match the weight of that volume of water against what you predicted the boat to weigh and where you think the center gra where the center of gravity is going to come. And you find, I mean, it's an iterative process. You do that three or four times, probably takes half an hour. And you can get, you can judge where the water line is going to sit within, I mean, really accurately. I mean, a millimeter or better quite easily. Um, now that whole process can be automated. There is software that, in fact, you can, I believe you can buy an add-on to SolidWorks that will do that automatically and do it in about a second or something. But I, I think it's probably not worth it because for uh, certainly for a, for a boat that's not, if you're only interested in something like a rowing boat that doesn't, you know, it's it just sits in the water. You're not interested in its self-writing properties really because you know it won't self-write <laughs> um, <laughs> as we found out. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's pretty quick to work the um, displacement and water line out just by iteration. Um, and then once you've got, once you've got the shape of your hull like that as a solid, um, I mean, a good, there's so many ways you could go from there, but I mean, a good next step is, is what solid works called a shell, which simply hollows it out. And so that's half of it all hollowed out, right? Um, and then you just, I mean, I, there's no point going through all the details, but you just keep building up from that. You put bulkheads in, you put, 
you put Rolex in, you put all the little bits in and you get to a complete model, which is something like this. Um, this is the rowing boat. Um, two pictures because, yeah, there's two, con it, SolidWorks calls it configurations, which is setups, if you like. So the top one is the way it looks when you've got a passenger. So there's somebody sitting in a seat here and the, the Rolex are a bit further forwards. And that's how it looks when there's just one person. And so the Rolex have an alternative um, position and no passenger seat. Um, and you can switch. I mean, it's just a clicker of the mouse will switch between configurations. So, you know, if you want to look, look at your boat in the water and then look at it on a road trailer, you know, just click the mouse and, and it will switch over the, from one to the other. Um, Does SolidWorks know how to the bend of the wood, whether you could actually do that with a piece of wood or with a panel? Um, you, you can work out the radius. You can work. It will tell you the radius of curvature of the panels. Well, uh, yeah. And, and, and then if, if you have an idea of how much curvature you can, if it's plywood, I mean, I haven't sort of taken advantage of that, but it does tell you the radius of curvature of the panels. It does. Oh, yeah, right. yes, that, 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 that certainly is something you can get out of it pretty easily. Um, I'm just going to make the point I would have done to get the weight and to make the, the center of gravity calculation right. I just put us, I just invented a heavy material like 10 times the density of lead and made a small cylinder to represent a person. And that would be the passenger, I suppose. Um, so that's why there's a little cylinder there. Um, yeah, that's that's the design. And then um, just, yeah, I mean, things like uh, a launching trolley, having got, that's the shape of the hull, it's, it's easy to sort of fit the launching trolley. So it's guaranteed to fit the hull. Um, I actually made a launching trolley just like this for the boat. And we've only ever used it once because we, we got the idea of, clipping wheels straight on the side of the boat, which I'll show you in a minute. And that's actually works much better than the launching trolley. Um, and again, if you're using a CAD system, you can do stress analysis as well with the system. Um, in this case, we've got, um, if you look at that other picture, the, um, because it's, you've got a sliding seat in this boat, the, um, the rollocks have to be quite a long way apart. There's a standard distance, which, uh, can't remember. I think it might be 60 inches between the Rolex. It's it's absolutely pretty well standard for every sliding seat rowing boat. Um, and if you've got a hull less than that width, you've got to extend it somehow. So that's what these fold these brackets fold up. Um, and then I, I made those from aluminium. Got the welding done by a, by a firm, but you know I made everything else out of the aluminium. Um, so. Yeah, that was just to make sure it was strong enough. It was a finite element analysis, not difficult to do with um, solid works. I, I don't know that you get um, that facility in a in a free in a free software. I'm not sure. You might do these days. Um, actually, you can, there is actually. Um, if you, yeah, if you if you get Open Phone, which is completely free, although it's meant for CFD, it's really meant for fluid mechanics. Um, Open Foam does have a solid solver as well, which I've never used it. But so, yeah, you could do, I think you could do um, this sort of stress analysis for nothing with Open Foam. But it's, tell you, Open Foam's a very difficult, well, I find it very difficult software to understand how to use it. Um, whereas SolidWorks is really very intuitive, very easy. Um, and you can get pictures, you know, line drawings. It doesn't just, it doesn't have to be shaded pictures like this. Um, it can be um, a traditional line drawing, either, you know, perspective drawings, which are nice for visualizing little parts of the boat, or you can do proper, you know, what we used to, you know, when we you know, learned <laughs> drafting a bit at college, you know, BS 308, wasn't it? I don't know if anybody still works for BS 308, but I do. <laughs> you do. Really? Jasper's nothing. I do. Well, <laughs> yeah, you can. A copy. SolidWorks generates that kind of drawing. Um, Unfortunately, and, and I do it by hand. Yeah. What? 
You I'm, did, yeah, well, I, my drawings by hand. I hated. I mean, I had to at one point. <laughs> I, I mean, we had to do it at one point. We had to do it with with ink. Yeah. Uh, on plastic yeah. film, and it, you know, you, the ink, you get ink blots, <laughs> and you have to scratch the ink blots out with a razor blade. So I, sp I spent busy. three days learning how to draw arrows. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when I was <laughs> training. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we seem to have an audience of yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, solid works. You just you know, it just takes a solid model and. Okay, there's a little bit, you, you know, if you want to tidy it up, you want, you probably, you, you choose which dimensions, where you want to put dimensions and things. It doesn't, mm. it may even do that automatically if you want, but you probably want to choose how you do the dimensions. You want, you'll you want to choose how many decimal points, where, where if you're working yeah. to microns or, or inches or whatever. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's basically all, just does this sort of thing automatically and gives you little, isometrics as well which are handy to see what what it looks like yeah. um, and then the really useful thing from this is really useful for boat building in plywood and I, I must say I think mean, I've built two, I've only built about three boats in plywood um, but that's more boats than I've built in any other material but I, I did get involved in um, with a yacht a, a mast maker at, at one point in the uh, would have been early two, about 2000 or 90s um, and we were making some of the early carbon fiber masks. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I, my, my feeling was that making anything out of composites is a lot more work than making it out of wood, actually. Not everyone seems to agree with that. But <laughs> I still think plywood, if you want to make a boat quickly and easily, plywood is, you won't do better than plywood. You make a better boat out of foam sandwich and carbon fiber, but it's a lot more work than making it out of plywood. So anyway, for a plywood boat, it, it, you've got this, um, you've got a picture like this, and then um, for all the flat parts, most of the parts of the boat are flat, in fact. I mean, things like seats and the sides of buoyancy tanks, the bulkheads, they're all flat. Uh, it's about two or three mouse clicks. You just click on the surface and it turns it into what's called a DXF file, which is the file you need to have it the parts cut out automatically by a company that cuts sheet material. Um, it's a bit more difficult for the curved panels in the side of the boat. Um, SolidWorks will do this. Um, it's got a sheet metal function that, that will handle this. It's a little bit more than just two or three mouse clicks actually, but you know, it's, it's quite doable. And, um, and this is quite a simple hull shape. There aren't very many curved panels in it. It's just the deck. Uh, two top sides, a, a sort of chime panel in the flat bottom. So those, I've got those as DXF files like that. Those are the curved, all the panels that need to be curved, flattened out, right? They're not, right, there's, those are, you know, developed, they call it, made flat. Um, and then because, um, you know, plywood comes in eight by four sheets and the boat's 15 feet long, you have to have some joints, which I did with these zigzag type of scarves, which work very well. So I cut cut the flat panels in the software like that. Um, yeah, those those that top one I did as four pieces, so that each piece was only four feet long, so that I could have the main grain of the plywood transverse. Because I didn't, yeah, the long ones I wanted the long thin panels. I wanted the grain lengthwise. And the bottom of the boat, actually, I think it's better with the grain across, makes it stronger when you stand on the bottom. Uh, and the deck, obviously that's the deck. I haven't put that side in because it's the same as this one, the other way up. Um, but all the little details like the holes for the, um, you probably can't see it at that scale, but they're even the, you know, screw holes for attaching fittings were, were all cut out um, automatically. Um, and then SolidWorks, I don't think, does this bit. I actually bought some, I rented, you can, this is something you can uh, find on Google um, software. You can, you can rent it for five pounds a, a go or something. And um, it does the nesting, which means you've got all the parts of the boat as, from SolidWorks as um, DXF files. 
and then you want to fit them all onto as few sheets of plywood as possible because the plywood you know is 100 pounds a sheet or something top quality plywood um, and uh, it does that automatically saves a lot of material um, and I did everything, even that little launching trolley and everything. Some of the parts, you know, are smaller than your hand. Um, none of the parts are, you know, all that big. Um, I mean, one point here is if you get these things cut out by a company, I didn't, I assumed I would get the waste and I thought that would be useful. Some of these bit, some of these waste bits be useful if I have to repair the boat. But of course they just thought, well, that's waste and threw it away. <laughs> um, I would, I would say, make a note. Yeah, I'd just say, well, can I, if there's a big piece of, what, what you could do is just draw some square panels to fill up any space. Yeah, and then you would have those for repairs. It wouldn't be thrown away because you don't really want all the tiny thin bits. That... <laughs> yeah, um, and then it just, I, I waited a long time. They took a long time. Uh, it's a company at, at uh, near Tipperton that did this for me. It wasn't all that expensive. It's, it cost less than the plywood, put it that way. Um, and it saved so much work. I mean, you know, if you really want to save money, you you could just take the DX, you could take the CAD files. Um, you could probably plot them on, you know, especially if you find someone with a big plotter or go to a, you know, a place in town that does that, and then print them out on paper and you could cut round, you could do it that way, but just so much easier to have it all done, <laughs> done by a machine. Um, and this was a water jet cutter. The other way to do it is with write, um, a CNC router. Now, I, asked, I asked about CNC router and the water jet cutting was about half the price. And just, I think just as accurate. Um, I mean, you can't, the water jet cutting only cuts. It won't do, it won't, it, it doesn't work in 3D. You can't make a 3D shape. You can just cut out shapes in 2D. Um, but that's fine for, for a plywood boat. And yeah, I mean, they, 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 it obviously wasn't their priority job. It had to wait a long time, but eventually, you know, it came as a, as a great stack of parts all packaged in plastic. On a, on a pallet. Um, that's what it all looked like. And some of the parts quite minute and some big. Um, and then started. Well, then, hmm? Did you send them the um, uh, marine yeah. ply? Oh, yes, I did. Yes, I got the, the plywood was from Robbins, is it called, in Bristol. And we went up to Bristol and collected the sheets of plywood on the roof rack. It's three millimeters thick, which is, you know, quite thin, but. It's quite strong enough for this boat. Um, Robin's Elite, I think it's called. It's I just say it was a hundred pounds a sheet. It's not quite that much, but it's it's mm. getting on, it's getting that way. Um, but it's nice ply. I mean, I yeah, I mean you could use you could use much cheaper plywood, but mm -hmm. I mean the Robin's plywood is you know you can tell that it's a good a good quality and it, it doesn't you know it's it's it it doesn't it doesn't have flaws in it in the middle. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, um, as I say, um, joined, made the long parts with these um, zigzag joints. Um, and I think it's quite critical to line them up, you see, because, the, you know, they're long and thin. So you could easily stick them together at slightly misaligned. So the way I got them all lined up was um, when I did the, um, at the computer stage, I put little um, holes. You can just about see one there and one there. I put, so that, those holes were cut by the water jet cutting. I fill them up later with epoxy. That's no problem. You can easily fill small holes with epoxy. Um, and so you've got little holes each side of each joint and then stretch a piece of string along the length, that, you know, and, and, and you can line them up perfectly um, and then just tack them down onto your bench or whatever. It was just a temporary bench. Um, I, I trust the piece, horizontal alignment, piece of stretch piece of string is perfectly accurate, isn't it? I, I personally wouldn't trust it for vertical alignment, although, you know, houses are built with string stretched horizontally for, you know, they, they work both ways, but for boat building, you know, you, I wouldn't trust the string other than horizontal. Um, I mean, if you want accurate, 
vertical alignment, you'd use a, la use a laser beam these days because you buy a little laser for very little money, about less than 20 pounds, I think. Um, so that's how the panels fitted together. And um, yeah, that's a close up showing the little holes and the string. And um, then I, I put just a layer of glass on the inside, um, glass fiber. It's all epoxy, not polyester actually, because the epoxy is recommended with plywood. Um, weighted it down and you've got a, a flat joint. Um, and I didn't put anything on the outside so as to leave the outside of the boat as smooth as possible. Um, I'm sure that's as strong as the rest of the wood really, no significant weakness in the joints. And then the other start putting the boat together, it goes, I mean, as long as the panels are all cut out accurately, it goes together pretty quickly. Um, and one thing you have to check for is, I found out this when I built my first boat years ago, that although the panels are accurate, you can still get a twist along the length of the boat very easily if you're not careful. Um, so you just have to sight and put some straight edges across the boat in different positions along the length and sight along it and, and then twist it a little bit till it's sure that there isn't a twist along the length of the boat. Um, then making the metal bits, um, yeah, I've got a little um, a little lathe and a very small um, sort of hobbyist milling machine. Um, so I was able to, these parts are quite easy to make and I got somebody to do the welding with a TIG welder. Um, should have got them anodized. Everything's gone um, slightly um, because it's used so much in salt water, um, but it will last quite, last a few decades, I think. Um, things like that's the stem, the um, computer cut out. These are tiny little parts, you know, cut out layers of plywood to build up the shape um, and um, then just take an angle grinder and, and, and grind the ridges off and you've got an accurate shape that will fit exactly, you know, to sort of a millimetre or less tolerance in the front of the boat and make this make the stem piece. Um, yeah, coated, coated all the panels with epoxy um, before I put it together. It's easier to do it on a flat surface slightly. Um, I actually left uncoated bits around the edge thinking that it would be stronger for the taping of the panels together. I don't know if it makes any difference. Um, and I found one thing I found quite it's a very untidy garage at that stage. Um, one thing I found quite useful was just to suspend the boat with a piece of string from the rafters. It, that's a piece of rope goes round underneath the hull and back up the other side. And if you hang the boat like that, um, you can just turn it over, you turn it upside down or turn it on its side. So you, you know, you always get it in the best angle to work on it. And, you know, for painting the bottom, you can easily just spin it over and paint the bottom. as though it was a, you know, working on a table. Um, and yeah, it works, that works very well for a, for a lightweight boat. I mean, I don't know if you do a big yacht like that. Um, perhaps you could do it if you've got a strong enough roof. Um, mm. And then just to show, you know, things that would be really quite tricky to do without the computer. Um, this boat's got um, it's got a sort of remote control steering arrangement where um, a push pull rod goes through the back of the boat and works the rudder. And so it needed holes that go through these bulkheads and they've all got to line up fairly accurately. Um, and of course the computer just, the solid works has already positioned the holes in the bulkheads. I mean, even the one that's sloped, I mean, that bulkhead's at an angle, uh, no problem making the holes all line up. Um, and they're all, the holes are all in the plywood when it comes from the cutting process. You don't have to drill any holes. I mean, even things like the, um, the rudder fittings, the holes to, to bolt them on are already cut by the machine. So, you know, not a difficult thing to do by hand, you know, but it saves having to get out a, a ruler and a set square and mark out where your rudder fittings are going to go. They just go where they, where the holes are, and then they'll be, they will be spot on. Um, and so I, I stitched it together the old fashioned way with copper wire. A lot of people use um, the plastic cable ties now, but um, I actually had copper wire <laughs> left over from another project. Um, 
So you know, I've got masses of copper wires, so um, I use that for the stitches. Um, Did you have all the holes put in by the cat of the... Could have done, no, no, I didn't actually. He could do, I thought about it. I thought about it, but I wasn't quite sure how close I was going to need to put them. Um, yeah. But, you know, another time, yes, you could, because I'd have an idea. I didn't know whether I was going to put them every six inches or every 12 inches or what. So, yeah, that's, but it, you could do. And it, yeah. it, could, it could be worth doing because then you get them all exactly the right distance from the edge. Um, and it wouldn't cost any more. It didn't make it, I don't think it make any difference the cost of the cutting. No. Um, and then we put the wheels on. These, um, it's, I mean, this trolley was, <laughs> I spent a lot of time making that trolley and especially the, the axle, which was in three pieces. So it was, you go in the back of the, fold up in the back of the boat. And it hasn't been, we've only used it once and it was, it's, it's actually the trolley is better if you have to cross soft sand, it's good. But I mean, in most situations, these thin wheels, they, and they just clip on the side of the boat, they're so handy. And when we go on long trips, we take the, we always take the wheels in the boat. And then if we, you know, if we need to get the boat round a lock or something, and we can't go through the lock, we, we can wheel it round on the wheels. Um, and we, if we're camping, we take use this boat for camping and we can um, wheel it up the bank at night and get it onto the onto dry land. Um, so they, they're actually wheelchair. They're off wi a wheelchair, the type of wheelchair that people carry in a car boot. So it's got detachable wheels and they just clip in. There's the sockets in the side of the boat. They just you just push the wheel push the the socket and, and it locks in and then there's a button in the middle of the wheel that re releases it. It's so handy. Yeah. Um, but I mean, it's a pity. The I mean, it's a pity the, um, the spokes and things are not stainless steel. <laughs> it's like, the rims are the rims are aluminium, but the spokes are are, are tending. You know, be careful with rust eventually. Enough to get new ones. Um, putting the deck on, um, and then sand everything. I, I sanded a night a, a rounded gunnel which I thought looks better than the usual sort of thing um, and I put these I made these handles they, these are handles these slots um, but we don't actually you probably don't they look they look nice but they they're a little bit too um, low for, for, for carrying the boat a long way so we actually tend to um, just have a, have some rings on the front for the painter and we just put a rope handle on the front um, and then it's getting painted and um, that was the most tricky bit of woodwork because I wouldn't claim to be a brilliant woodworker. Getting, getting this, um, this is veneer, oak veneer actually, and getting that to fit round the boat. Um, purely decorative, doesn't have any, any function other, other than decoration. Yeah, and I, I found making the, <laughs> I probably didn't get it quite right, making the joint at the, where the pieces meet is, I found tricky. Um, even though, I mean, the computer, I got the shape of the veneer from the computer, but, you know, even so, it was tricky getting a, a join in the middle. And then it's all finished, and Josephine was pleased with it. <laughs> it was a bit very suspicious of it to start with, actually, <laughs> because it wasn't quite what she had been expecting, I think. Um, and it was much bigger than I mean, she had the idea, I think Josephine had the idea it was going to be a tiny boat that she could more or less pick up in one hand. But then again, if it's going to carry two people and then we wanted to go camping in it, it can't be that small. And it ended up <laughs> moderately big boat, actually. Looks quite what does it? What does it weigh all about up? About 45 kilos. And that's of all the bits and pieces. So, yep. yeah, it's, you know, I, I'm amazed that I mean, people claim incredibly lightweight for their boats. I suspect they don't weigh everything that goes with the boat. <laughs> but, um, yeah. you know, this is, this is three millimetres plywood. How thin are you going to go? I mean, <laughs> you yeah. know, you, that you, that's probably the, about the lower limit for plywood thickness. It's, 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 it's coated with um, epoxy on the inside but no no glass cloth on the inside just epoxy and paint and no glass on the outside there is glass on the outside oh there is yeah. and that's probably where some of the weight comes from yeah um 
uh, and and I think it needs. I, I I don't regret putting the sheathing on because. I mean, we've used this boat a lot and it, it tends to land on stony beaches a lot. And um, all the paint has gone off the bottom now. <laughs> there's, a, there's no paint on the bottom and, 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 the, and the glass fibre sheathing is, is scratched to some extent. In fact, yeah. I had to put some extra sheathing on the, this bit round the front where we land on a beach. has had to be reinforced since the boat was built. So, I mean, mm. if that boat had just been epoxy and no glass, I think that would have worn through to the wood um, by now easily. So, you know, I think by the time you've got the plywood and you've got the epoxy coating and the glass on the outside, you know, and, and, and bits of furniture in the boat, I can't see how you could make it all that much lighter. But, I mean, with foam sandwich and carbon fiber, they get these racing rowing boats down to like a quarter of that weight. I mean, it's, which yeah. is incredible. Um, I mean, if you want a really high quality boat, that's, I don't think there's any option, but to do, you know, resin yeah. infusion with carbon fiber. And that makes, yeah, as I was talking to Kim about it earlier today, it's, it's yeah. a huge job and it, it requires huge amounts of consumable material that's thrown away at the end of the process. Yeah. Uh, and plywood is just 10 times quicker and easier to my way of thinking. Yeah. And it's not as good. It won't make as good a boat. And, you know, and after 50 years, it might start to rot. You know? Anyway, that was that was launching the boat at Mount Batten in Plymouth, a very local slipway. Um, and the first thing we found out that very first day was that the rudder was too small and we couldn't steer it. It just went out of control. Um, and because it's... Um, it's it's the shape of the, the stern is very flat underneath so there's very little directional stability in the hull which I think I knew that was going to be the case because um, our sailing dinghy is exactly the same um, and I find certainly for the sailing dinghy that's an advantage because you can turn really you can tack very sharp if you have to um, for a rowing boat it's still an, it's a, it's a, it means that you need a rudder you, it would you couldn't row this boat really without a rudder um, but it's a moot point whether are you better off making um, a directionally, you know, you, the, a lot of rowing boats have a sort of skeg at the stern or the, the stern comes into a sort of wine glass transom with a, what's effectively a skeg under the water, which is increasing the wetted surface. Um, is it actually, is that better or is it better to have a completely um, flat underneath stern that, that's got very little directional instability and then put a rudder on which will as soon as you put a rudder on it goes straight as long as the rudder's big enough and this one was just a tiny bit too small um, and then yeah I mean we I mean we launched it one day and then the very next use of the boat without any more testing um, was um, a trip with a group of guys down the River Thames say group of guys, there's Josephine was the one exception, I think. Um, uh, we rode from Letchley down to Beale Park for the boat show. Um, and we hadn't had time to change the rudder, so we couldn't steer. And the boat was going all over the place. And eventually we found a, we found a piece of wood that somebody had thrown away and, you know, just on the riverbank. And we tied it to the little rudder to make it a bit bigger. And we could just about steer then. But it didn't, it wasn't, it wasn't looking, it wasn't easy getting down the Thames like that. But uh, since then we put a big, slightly bigger rudder on, not much bigger, it's just perhaps two or three inches longer, it makes all the difference. So it's a good trip, that was a very nice trip. And they still do that, not with COVID of course, but um, it's become an annual, it's very informal, nobody, I assume it will be an annual event. It's been going on every year for five or six years or something like that. And we've done it. We've done it twice. Um, once with the rowing boat, and once with our rowing our sailing dinghy, which is much harder work than this um, sliding seat rowing boat. Um, uh, yeah, I mean that. And then we got from Letchlade in Gloucestershire. We got down to um, the Beale Park boat show near Reading, and they have this competition, boat building competition, um, which is of course not happening now because Beale Park's not happening. And uh, we won a prize. There were four boats who entered in the competition and there were four prizes available. So mm. everybody won a prize, which was great. Um, 
I think we got the technical innovation prize. Um, this beautiful boat got the sort of craftsmanship prize. Uh, this little one got some prize. Best and, beginner. Oh, best boat for beginners or something. And, and this one, um, this is an heirs member actually who built this red one. Can't remember his name. Um, it's made with um, it's skin on frame boat. It's made with canvas over a framework. And there's the rowing boat. Now, and one thing you see, it's on its wheels. And we had the idea that Josephine could, um, she's got a, a folding bicycle. And we thought, well, she, to get the boat down to the beach on her own, because she doesn't drive the car, she could tow it with a bicycle <laughs> and then put the bicycle in the back of the boat. The bike is, the bike will fold up and go in the back of the boat. It's quite a lot of space there. Um, and do it that way, but it, oh. it worked. We, we've only tried it once, um, and it worked quite well at Beale Park, which is fairly level. It's Josephine <laughs> towing the boat around Beale Park, impressing people. Um, I just isn't. I don't think that is really practical on the public no. road. It's too big. Too low. It's long. too big and unwieldy. <laughs> Um, no, yeah. really hard also if you had to go up a hill oh, I yep. mean it was significantly hard, hard work and, and going downhill you need good brakes <laughs> <laughs> but, but it, you know it was, quite, it, was it was fun to do it it was fun at Beale Park but it was not a practical thing <laughs> anyway um, lovely almost Can I, have I got a minute or two have I finished yeah. I just yeah, know it's ten past six, but uh, I think. Oh uh, yeah, gosh, when yeah. did we start? Half five? Oh, that's not too bad, is it? Yeah. Yeah. You, went, you went on longer than that. So oh, I, thought, I did. Yeah, you did. You yeah. did. Yeah, we tend to overrun on the AYRS talks. So it's only. I'm not sure it's a good thing, but yeah. very quickly, yes. I mean, we did because this is the Amateur Yacht Research Society. We did. Um, this drag prediction for the for the for the rowing boat. We ran it twice: once for the rowing boat with two people in it, and once for the rowing boat with one person. You notice, you know, how accurately with computers you can work out. You know, the draft is eighty-one millimeters there, and then when you put an extra person in, the draft is one hundred and seventeen millimeters. The beam goes up from 666 millimetres to 751 millimetres. All this is very precise, isn't it? The blue line, I think, will be the viscous drag. This is the red line, the wave making drag, and that's the green line is the total drag. So obviously more total drag with two people in it, as you'd expect. Um, and we tested this. We, we, we had a special meeting at um, yes. a AYRS <laughs> meeting, which was great fun. Um, at the Basingstoke Canal Centre, which is not at Basingstoke, it's near Farnborough. Um, and we, we, yeah, we, it, it was um, quite good. Um, the late Fred Ball, um, unbeknown to me, because I've been wondering how we were going, we're going to need to tow the boat to measure the drag. Fred actually, without telling me, I mean, he made all this in his garage to, for the trial. Um, and it's a, a bicycle um, adapted, you know. So that this is Tim Fisher, Tim, sorry, Tim Glover, Tim, Tim Glover, Tim Glover um, as committee member. And uh, on the, 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 this is like a big pulley with um, a long length of thin string, um, just a, a thin cord, um, 100 metres or something wrapped round. And uh, we got, we towed the boat, we set this up on a little promontory that sticks out into the canal and towed the boat along and um, the, um, the, the drag measurements done at the boat end, not at this end. Um, and uh, I, I made this box of electronics. That there's a load cell there. Anyway, there's a strain gauge amplifier circuit in there somewhere. And the red circuit board is an Arduino standard um, Arduino microprocessor. The, this purple string um, is attached to the tow line and loads, goes through a little hole in the box and loads the load cell. And then we recorded the, um, we recorded the, the tension in the string, the, which is the drag of the boat, of course. Um, and we spent a whole afternoon at least doing this. And uh, there were, you know, as you, you think, you, you think this is gonna be easy. 
and then you find this string gets caught in the pond weed, um, the boat hits the bank, all sorts of things go wrong. And there's a lot of other people using the canal at the same time. Um, and after, you know, a whole afternoon, really, we got one decent run and one set of drag measurements at one particular speed. And, and um, I put that on the, I don't know, it was, I put that on the um, plot and yeah, it was only one data point, but it was spot on the green line. Um, I don't know if that may, I wouldn't trust it from one point. Now, I've actually got a system now with infrared beams across the canal for to get the speed accurately. So, yeah, we could do this again someday when COVID's gone. <laughs> Things we could do. I mean, this. I've is, got a lot of holes you could pull. <laughs> well, we could. We could. I mean, I think there's better yeah. things to do with in airs, but. Um, yeah. The thing was that it was quite a good collaborative thing because yeah. we had probably 15 AIRS members turned up. It might have been something like that, which is mm. very good for AIRS because we don't get big crowds and um, everybody had something to do. You know, we had people. And something to look at. Yeah. yeah, we had some people turning the handles and two people in the boat and. Yeah, and, and people, um, people shouting at people coming down the canal <laughs> again. I think the airs could we could do with some more actual um, on the water activities. Um, yeah, uh, I mean the Zoom meetings are good, but um, it'd be nice to actually meet up afloat. That's something I think yeah. we'd like to try and encourage.
Keep going, keep going. Oh, she can do it. Back down.